Hello and welcome. It is June 4th. Uh, this is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we are working today on a study um, to, to add to, I think, Representative Coopley, maybe you could, that you, somebody needs to mute. <laughs> Um, we are looking at uh, the appropriations bill. Uh, we are looking to add uh, an amendment related to a study related to Vermont and our public higher education. A group of us have been working on this. Um, I know Peter Conlon has worked on this. Peter Fagan from Appropriations is joining us. Kathleen has worked on it. Um, Mike Marcotte from, from um, Commerce. And we have all heard from New England Board of Higher Education. And with us today also, I've enjoyed, I, I uh, invited the interim chancellor from the Vermont State Colleges, just so that we can compare what we're doing here with what they're doing to just make sure that we're not uh, redundant. That was a concern the committee had. So following the, the committee meeting um, the other day and some of your feedback, we have reworked uh, a proposal. Jim has put it into language and we have here um, as well. As, uh, so Jim Demeray and Joyce from uh, Joyce Manchester from JFO have worked on this draft along with help from the New England Board of Higher Education. So with that, um, uh, Jim and Joyce, could you uh, present the, the current draft? Um, what I'm looking at is this is something that you will be invited if you would like to be a sponsor. So as, a, as opposed to being at a committee amendment, it will be if you would like to join on as a sponsor, then you will let um, Jim and me know and we will put you on this, this. therefore not making it something that, that um, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to put your name on it. Um, so Jim and Joyce, could you, Avery, could you bring up the, the document? It's fresh off the printing press, so to speak. Okay, um, shall I start? Yes, that'd be great. Thank okay. you, Jim. So for the record, uh, Jim Damore of Edge Council, we are walking through draft 2.1 of this language. I was not aware this would be a an amendment. I thought this would be going into the uh, budget itself. So it's not in the form of an of amendment now. Okay, so that there's, that's some drafting issues that um, I might need some help with. So you, you can help me, you between you and Joyce and Peter Fagan, um, how this might work. If we're just dropping it in, that's great as well. Yeah, okay. So yeah. this is a single long section um, of session law that creates this uh, new committee called the Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont. Its purpose is to assist the state in developing a vision and plan for a high quality, affordable, uh, and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. <laughs> The membership uh, is comprised of up to 22 members. So we have 20 members specified. And then at the end, you'll see there's two other members which are discretionary. Um, so we have one member of the House, one member of the Senate, uh, the interim chancellor um, uh, VSC, um, and uh, an additional four reps from VSC, one from the board, one from the campus administration, one from the faculty, and one from uh, the students uh, appointed by the chancellor. Uh, we have the president of UVM um, and uh, a rep of the UVM board appointed by the president. We have the secretary of commerce and community, community development, the secretary of education, the Commissioner of Labor, uh, three representatives of the business community appointed by the steering group, uh, which we'll come on to. Uh, there will be a five-member steering group. Uh, steering group. Um, 
two community members representing regions in the state that are not otherwise represented, appointed by the steering group. Uh, the president of VSAC, uh, two uh, representatives from Vermont organizations uh, dedicated, dedicated to higher education or workforce development, appointed by the steering group. And then up to two further members appointed at the discretion of the steering group. <clears throat> so that's the membership. And before I go on to subsection C, uh, steering group, uh, are there any comments on that section? Or, or, Kate, or Rep, 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 do you want me to just go through the whole thing first? Um, I, I think that's it. I think that's just a good place to stop right there. Um, we spent quite a bit of time getting stuck on that the other day. Um, so I, you know, it might be helpful to go through the steering group first, and then we can look at the whole makeup because I think the steering group and the the select committee, um, because the steering group will be made up of members who will be on the select committee, would be okay. Would be helpful. Okay, so the steering group. Um, uh, so on on before June twenty nine. The Speaker of the House and the President Pro, uh, Pro Tem shall jointly appoint three members of uh, the committee, and the Governor shall appoint two members of the committee to serve as members of a steering group. Um, so that five-member steering group uh, shall provide leadership to the committee and work with the, a consulting firm to an analyze the issues, challenges, and opportunities facing uh, Vermont's post-secondary institutions as well as um, create a formal action plan to drive change uh, and innovation. Um, it may form one or more subcommittees of the, of the committee to address key issues uh, in greater depth. Um, and then why don't you just do D as well? Okay. And D is just collaboration. So recognizing that there may be a number of stakeholders that uh, would be valuable to have, uh, hear their input uh, but not to expand the committee further. Uh, this uh, says that the committee shall seek input from and collaborate with key stakeholders as directed by the steering group. Okay, mm -hmm. so questions, uh, Sarita Austin? Yep. Um, I'm wondering if there's, is there a faculty union or a faculty organization that might need to be represented here? I, I'm, not, I'm just not seeing any faculty, any teachers. I think there's there faculty reference for VSC. Um, so for the VSC representation, it's uh, the interim chancellor and then four reps. Can you scroll um, that, um, Avery? One, one of whom is a faculty member. Um, scroll a little bit further. Okay, I see. VSC sat faculty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have one member? They have five members to total. Total, yeah. One of, one of whom is faculty, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I'm seeing no further questions at this point. Oh, Dylan. Yeah, this is just a general comment and I, I don't mean to be uh, too harsh on legislators, but you know, I wonder if we do have a concern about size, I do wonder if it's necessary to have legislators on this panel. I don't know if that's a prerequisite, um, but for me personally, I would rather have um, some balance between the number of VSC representatives and UVMs and make it more similar because there isn't a UVM student trustee, there isn't a UVM faculty representative. And I don't wanna blow up this process because I know that we have a specific goal in mind, but. I just don't particularly feel I need to hear from more lawmakers on the subject of higher education because I'm not sure we have that much expertise relative to folks who actually are involved in those institutions. It's very specialized. Um, so that's just an observation. I, I would really welcome feedback from the committee, but um, I feel as though it's time to hear from experts uh, to tell the legislature what we need as opposed to the legislature weighing in on this particular matter. We actually had a, a good conversation about that, and we will be getting to the consultant, which which will be very important. But um, I think Candace, Michael, I think Michael Thomas, I think you had a, a comment on that, having worked on these kinds of things in the past, and the value of having a legislator or two on the. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, and uh, you know, I think it's a very valid point, and I, you know, I think um, I think this is probably less to hear from legislators um, in terms of you know viewpoint or expertise. I think it's more for legislators to have a defined role that from and vantage from which they can hear and be the recipients of the input and the testimony and the perspectives, not only from the other people on the the select committee, but the people who will sort of be brought in as witnesses and, um, you know, contributors to the process and having them there to hear and, you know, gather that input and be able to take it back to legislative leadership and to the legislature and also to help foster sort of, you know, further and expanded ownership of uh, within the legislature for the, the future of uh, public higher education in, in the state was really the, the purpose behind that. I, I would note that um, the current version is also, I think, fairly scaled down in terms of the number of legislators uh, from the original proposal, but I think that was our thinking. Larry Cooply, did you ever comment on that? Let's just be, uh, be on this for one quick Yes, and, and I, I certainly agree with Dylan's perspective on this. Um, I see the value of the legislature tuning in to this serious, serious problem, but having, a le having legislators on this committee, I, I think we hear enough testimony from the professional people involved that, that you know, I don't see where we need the legislators on, on the committee. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Kathleen, did you have something? Only to say that, um, I, I, you know, I'd be guided by the input of Nebby and having maybe at least, at least one rep if they feel that's of value. Um, but I had noted earlier um, the sort of imbalance between VSC and UVM, um, now that I take a second look at that and Dylan points it out, and I, you know, I don't wanna um, get too far into the weeds. I, I, I know how much we struggle with making lists like this, um, but I don't know whether there's a little bit of streamlining we could do in order to make room for a little bit more balance from UVM. Remember that we do have two extra slots in there to be determined, which is why we put those in. Yep, okay, uh -huh. thanks. Yeah, Sarita? Yes, um, I, I totally agree with Dylan. And if we do have a legislator on there, I hope it would be someone who is very on, has a lot of background knowledge and information of what's been occurring in the state college system. So they don't have to get up to speed or need to learn a lot of stuff. So UV, we have UVM trustees, legislators that are UVM trustees, and we have um, legislators that are VSC, right, trustees. So, I mean, at least they would have, you know, some understanding of the context of this conversation because we don't have a lot of time. And I, I would hope we wouldn't spend a lot of time getting anybody up to speed. I think I'm going to push back a little bit on this. I think I'm going to say that I think that we should have legislators on this. Um, I think in terms of moving forward and what we're going to be doing with this document, having le legislative buy-in and having people there to represent and speak for the group um, is helpful in moving forward. We don't know what kind of legislation might be coming out of this. Um, and I think having legislators there and in the process um, sort of stabilizes that commitment that we are going to do something. So that's my, that's my two cents. I'd like to agree with Kate on that. Yeah, I, I wasn't saying not to have legislators, but if we have some legislators that also could bring something to the table in terms of the conversation with skills and knowledge about this issue, it, it would be like a twofer, you know what I mean? So that's what, that's what I'm thinking. And there's nothing in here that we can't double up. I mean, I mean, you look at someone like Dylan who could be <laughs> who's a exactly trustee, like a thinking. legislator. <laughs> and and we have, is the language is the language flexible enough for us to? I was looking at the VSC thing, for example. Is the language flexible enough for us to count some as representing more than one one uh, entity, Jim? Um. Hmm. It doesn't contemplate that. So, hmm. I would say that 
It should be clarified if that's your intent. Yeah, um, yeah, because it, it, I think that's helpful. Peter Fagan? Kate, so you may have hit, you may have hit upon an idea where, and we cannot be so directive that we aim it at Dylan, but we can come fairly <laughs> close. And I would be very comfortable at doing that, by the way. But we can come fairly close by saying, um, you know, one current member of the House who shall also be currently serving as a member of the Board of Trustees at either uh, UVM or, or uh, the Vermont State Colleges, and then one member of the Senate who shall be currently serving, but we need one each member of, of trustees from each of the institutions. Um, as, a, as a thought. I know that, um, I think, Sophie, you had some creative ways that you were doing that to make sure that groups were represented um, in, in your group that uh, kept some of the numbers down, but um, kept the interests represented. Yeah, we, we did try, we thought about the different areas that we were looking at uh, for our task force, and then we tried to come up uh, collectively with the presidents of the colleges with uh, representatives that would, would meet the different um, things we were looking at so we didn't land up being too heavy in one area and not enough in another area. Um, I will say Dylan is, is uh, our trustee on our task force, so maybe his plea to have fewer legislators, maybe just he uh, <laughs> feels he's going to be uh, overwhelmed with being on uh, higher education task forces and committees. But um, yeah, we certainly uh, value having Dylan on our task force. Um, but yeah, we did try to get that balance. And I know uh, Representative Austin had asked about uh, unions on our task force. We do have a representative from each of our full-time unions on it, including the Faculty Federation, um, as well as our other two full-time units. Um, and to answer her question from earlier, we actually have three faculty unions. We have a full-time faculty, part-time faculty, and then the CCV faculty. So we have three uh, faculty unions, but they're all represented by the Faculty Federation. But there's, there's just a way that we can make sure the language doesn't uh, prom, you know, exclude someone from being double counted. Um, mm -hmm. I think would, would help. Oh, and welcome Representative Dickinson. I'm glad to see you, you're able to join us from uh, Commerce. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Peter Collin. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm gonna join in support of maintaining the small number of legislators that we have picked to go on there. Uh, but we might wanna be cautious about being too prescriptive as to who they are. People's circumstances change. Uh, every two years, um, and I know this is just a short-term committee. Uh, actually, when does our when does this end? It ends in uh, I think it's January of twenty-two. January twenty-two. So you know, things change, terms end. Uh, so we may not want to be too prescriptive, but I do support uh, legislators. Peter Fagan. Did you, are you still there? I, I, I Sorry, the Kate, I, I forgot to take my hand down. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So, um, in terms of, uh, can you, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask that we keep the two legislators. If there's a way that Jim can make sure that the language does not include, ex exclude someone from, from being double represented. Okay, so so yeah, I can work that in. Um, uh, representing two groups, that is. Yeah, yeah. We certainly did that when we did the the special ed advisory group, as you well remember. Um. Well, we did initially, and then we changed the whole. whole oh, we did. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. Should I, should I continue? Yes. So okay. I, Nidia, you're okay. I can't see faces here. Are you okay if we, we do that? Trying not to be. Yep. Yeah. If you if you don't agree, let me see that your little blue hand. <laughs> All right, we're good. So we'll we'll keep the two. Okay. Okay. So we're on subsection E, which is powers and duties. Uh -huh. So there are three principal uh, areas, but the lead, leading language says um, that the committee shall study the structure, 
of current higher education of the current higher education system in Vermont, build on previous studies in this area, and offer recommendations on how to increase affordability, access, retention, attainment, relevance, and fiscal sustainability, including the following issues. Uh, and these three categories tie into the timing of the reports you'll get back. Um, and I will go through that later in the, in the um, language. But the first area is uh, the financial sustainability of the public higher education structure and its impact on institutional capacity to innovate and meet state goals and learners' needs, including a comparison of, of higher education programs, delivery models, and structures in other states. Two, um, the current organizational structure of um, public higher education in, in Vermont and its ability to promote student success. And three, the alignment of higher education and workforce development goals, policy frameworks, and partnerships between businesses and institutions of higher education that are designed to meet the needs of employee, employer, employer, sorry, and promote the public value of education. Any comments on that? Seeing none. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, F is the. Gonna, Lynn, did you have something on, on this? No, no I'm, I'm fine. just reading. Okay. Other Lynn. <laughs> okay. We have two Lynn's. <laughs> I know, but her real name's not Lynn. <laughs> Um, Sarita Austin, did you have something? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so F is the um, subsection dealing with the hiring of a consultant. So it says JFO in collaboration, in collaboration with uh, Nebi shall issue a request for a proposal to hire a consultant to assist the, the committee, committee with responses due for interested parties on or before July 17. And the consultant, consultant has to be selected by July 31st by the steering committee, steering group. So, th and this is, this consultant is probably more of a firm <laughs> uh, with more than one person is what my, my understanding is, I think Nebby, you might have a, a little bit to say about um, possible consultants that have been used to uh, address issues like the ones facing us today. Can sure. Yeah. Um, in our experience, um, what you've just described is fairly accurate that this would be one organization that would probably employ a small team of folks to undertake some of the research and analysis that's described here. Um, we are familiar with a few such firms and I know that Joyce has been in conversation with one of them, which is the National Center on Higher Education Management Systems, which conducted a similar um, report and analysis for the state of Pennsylvania in the very recent past, um, but also has worked with Connecticut on their student, student's first consolidation plan um, and in a couple of the other New England states. One example among several other that may apply for such an RFP. Great. Okay, so, so an awful lot of the meat <laughs> It's going to be performed by the consultant, but making sure that stakeholders and members of our community in higher education and, and communities are involved in, in the direction here. Stakeholders, okay. Um, so we're up to G. Okay, G, G is the assistance. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, administrative and technical uh, assistance comes from JFO, and uh, Nebi will provide project management support. Okay. The reports are phased, as I mentioned. Um, so the first uh, interim report will be due on before December 20 of this year, and we'll focus on the topics uh, described in subdivision E1, 
So remember, there are three areas. Uh, so the first report's on that first area. And that first area, as a reminder, um, is uh, dealing with um, looking at the financial sustainability of the public higher education structure, et cetera. The uh, second uh, report will be due, due uh, by June 15 of next year. And we'll focus on the other two areas, which were the um, organizational structure of public higher education uh, and alignment with workforce uh, initiatives. Um, and the third report uh, would collate the findings of the first two and include the action plan. And that report would be due uh, by December 15 of next year. All the reports would be in writing and delivered to the General Assembly and the governor. Okay. What well, comments? Serena, Austin? Yep. yep. I had just, uh, when I wrote to you, Kate, in, mm -hmm. in the phase two, bullet two, I'm not sure if I'm using the same documents, but I just wanted to add. Uh, yeah, we, we have changed that one since then. We, we did used to have four, we now have uh, three. Okay, did, did you add the word though? I added um, when you were describing the different categories of students, you know, low income. I asked if minorities could also be included in that. Um, I, we don't have that in this draft. Okay, I wonder if we, can we, because it, it looked like those were some of the students that we were hoping to be able to reach. So it, it was in the, the um, I, I don't know. If it was, up, can you scroll up, scroll up um, Avery, back to that? Keep going so, up, Avery. Which, uh, which I think it's E, e maybe? Uh, right here, it, yeah. 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 Um, in another document, the three phases, I believe, were described in terms of what the consultant may be yeah. doing, what the outcomes were. So this was in phase two of that document, bullet two. But do you know which one I'm talking about? Um, I'm sorry, I just, I apologize. <laughs> I just got All right. Um, I, I, think, I, I think, I, I can't quite remember that, but uh, I think, um, we're, we're in this one, we're trying to be more general in our language. I, I think that that can certainly um, come out in the letter that we will write. Okay. We're certainly interested in some of our target populations. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, what I saved from our Nebi presentation, the future of learning and earning, described as, as being learner centric. Uh, workforce to connected, future and talent focused, and stakeholder engaged and under learning set learner centric includes delivery models and target populations. And so I think that we can probably address some of that to make sure that we're hitting those target populations. Does that does that help? Yeah, at all? it was I think in the maybe the proposal that Debbie sent in terms yeah. of an outline. And so that that there were the three phases in that and it was I, there was a second phase bullet too that I just thought that would go in nicely, but yes, yeah. that was that was a very that was a much more fleshed out document that may end up being more in the letter. Okay, that, that we will write. Um, Thank you. Too, but but we do want to make sure that we are we are addressing we are addressing our target populations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, particularly as those are those are probably our best source of, of enrollment as well. Um, anything else? Okay, so let's keep going then. I don't think we've hit the bottom yet, have we? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're getting there though. Um, the report, yeah. Yeah, meaning, so we're on I, so line 19. Um, so the secretary should call the first meeting of the, of the committee on before August 28th of this year. Um, and then down further, uh, the speaker and the president pro tem shall jointly select the committee chair, uh, majority will be a quorum, uh, and the committee would cease to exist on July 1, 2022. Um, 
The next is compensation reimbursement. One and two is, is the standard language that we always put in here of a per diem and um, reimbursement. Uh, if you go down to three, um, a bit further down, Avery. Um, so he talks about the number of, of meetings per year, per fiscal year. So uh, compensation would be for uh, six in-person meetings of, of the committee, eight in-person meetings of the steering group, and four remote meetings of up to four subcommittees, assuming compensation and reimbursement for up to five members of each subcommittee. Uh, and the, the uh, the appropriation is to JFO uh, to make those payments. And then if you scroll down further, the last section is the appropriation. So we got $40,000 approximately for the per diem and reimbursement and uh, 250,000 for the um, consultant. And that is it. Okay. Um. Other, Peter uh, Fagan, maybe you can help us a little bit with the number. Now we came up with that. Sure, it's this is um, a standard calculation based upon how much the the uh, legislative individuals receive on a per diem basis, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because it has changed, and I, I'll I'll get it wrong. Uh, plus, then the per diem basis uh, with mileage, and we have to calculate that in now, whether it's Zoom or not, to be determined when when these things start. Uh, but it needs to be calculated in now and put into the uh, into the uh, numbers here. So that's that's really how we got the uh, forty thousand dollar amount. The two fifty is a best estimate, I believe. Nebby uh, uh, came up um, and, and assisted us with that. And just so that you know, we're still trying to identify a, a place uh, where we can get these funds. Uh, identify. We, we're still trying to identify where we're going to pull these funds from for fiscal year 21 out of the general fund, which as you know, has got almost nothing in it. So, but this is just too darn important not to. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Joyce, do you have something? Um, uh, Lynn Dickinson. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question um, as a BSC trustee. We have some parallel tracks going on here. Yes. Um, we have, um, as Sophie knows, we have a task force uh, that's been organized by her as the interim chancellor. Um, you've got, we've got a search committee looking for a longer term interim chancellor that would be on the same time frame. Um, this is a search committee for the VSC board that would be looking at an interim longer term chancellor until we come up with a solution or an options a, B, and C, or whatever, to uh, make the VSC system uh, sustainable. And now you've got a steering group. Um, and I, I know the steering group has a very so slightly different um, um, charge than what the VSC board is trying to do, but I think we're all sort of, I'm wondering if we're all bumping into each other and um, maybe counting on the same $250,000 that may or may not be there for, certainly for all of it, to, uh, to accomplish sort of the same goal. I know uh, yours is a broader, a broader charge to look at all of higher education. Ours is simply to get someone who can get us into a place where we can make some hard decisions and, and get a sustainable uh, system for the campuses, colleges, whatever it may be. But that's my that's my initial question, and I think it's an important one as we look at all these parallel tracks. Um, well, I would certainly check in with, with Sophie. Um, so perhaps, Sophie, do you have anything that you can add in terms of what our, the scope of our work and the scope of your work? Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Lynn, for, for speaking up in terms of what we're doing um, over at the VSC. Uh, we do have a, a task force that we announced on Monday um, to the Board of Trustees and they approved moving forward. Uh, we're on a, a slightly uh, shorter time frame than what this select, select committee is. We're looking at getting proposals back from the task force, or at least an initial read back from them in mid-August and then sort of final decisions towards the, um, the end of this calendar year. Again, we have um, 
union contracts um, that have provisions in them, and so it's and students obviously who need to know what's going to happen. So depending on what changes we're looking at, we need to let people know as soon as possible so they can plan accordingly. So we have quite a short timeline. Um, I did share with um, Representative Kate Webb in terms of concerns about how these two, uh, our task force and the select committee would work together, but I do believe that it's valuable to have this select committee, that it, it serves a different purpose, it's at a higher level, it's going to look at a, more comprehensively at higher education, public higher education across the state. I think it can have conversations and um, look into issues that um, even our system-wide task force um, isn't really equipped to do. Uh, we do exist for the for the benefit of the state of Vermont. That's our our charge uh, from the from the, the legislature in the statute. And I do think the select committee has a valuable role to play in informing us as to what it is that will be in the best interest of Vermont as we move forward. Um, my hope is that we'll we'll stay in close communication with the select committee. That we'll make sure we're not uh, running into each other. Um, I would hope that the select committee will defer, um, you know, where the experts in terms of internal experts at the Vermont State Colleges, um, you know, have their expertise, um, you know, just going back to some of the comments that were made earlier. But I'm, I'm hopeful that the, these, these actually could all re really be beneficial. I think we'll hopefully feed off each other in a productive way. And again, it may be the select committees taking that, the, the next higher level view over our task force and it can help um, direct and steer and motivate our task force to do what it needs to do, knowing that there's there's another committee out there looking as well. So um, I think we're, we're just going to have to stay in close touch. We certainly don't want to get to a point where our internal task force is really strongly encouraging us to move in direction A and the select committee is saying, no, 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 move in direction B. That would be a waste of everyone's time and effort. So I, I would hope there would be um, you know, strong communication between the groups moving forward. But I think we'll be looking much more at the, the local level and our footprint and what we can be doing internally. Um, and I think we'll be a little bit ahead of the select committee, which hopefully will be helpful so that they'll know what we're doing, um, so they won't be duplicating uh, what we're doing, but hopefully building on it. Hey, thank you. I'm Kathleen James. Thank you. Um, I had actually had, as Kate knows, a very similar first reaction um, and a very similar first question um, for, for Peter and the APROPS committee um, and was al also a little bit worried about overlap between the select committee and the task force, um, the Vermont Forward. And, but it does, make, it does make me wonder or bring me back to our earlier question about the composition of the board and um, not to beat a dead horse, but whether we might not revisit um, the number of members on this committee between UVM and uh, the state college system. I actually have um, a message in from Wendy Koenig from UVM asking to participate. Um, you know, we are working at a speed of light in a world of remote remote meetings. Um, and she I, unfortunately can't meet before then. So, but I have sent the draft to her. I've also sent the draft to VSAC since we put them on it as well. And I, we I do know, know, yeah, go I ahead. I know we're focusing obviously on publicly, you know, publicly funded higher ed. So we're not gonna be talking about, you know, Vermont's independent schools, but if, if we do have parallel steering committees and task forces here, it does make me think about maybe boosting up UVM's presence here, um, even if that comes with, you know, one or two slightly less voices for VSC. And, and I, you know, I would be interested in hearing from Sophie on that. I'm... So, Sophie, what is your timeline? Can you remind me what your timeline is for your Vermont Forward Group? Yeah, so we have asked our task force to come back with just, just sort of um, recommend, not re necessarily final recommendations, but just a report on what they're doing uh, by mid-August. But our goal would be if, if we're looking at doing um, significant reconfiguration, um, that we would know that before the end of the year. Um, again, I mean, I think we've taken to heart um, 
and appreciate the support that we're getting from the legislature, but I, I think our anticipation was that we would have this one year in which to, um, you know, figure out what we're going to do. And again, it takes time with, in higher education to make changes. So, for example, when we um, consolidated Johnson and Linden into the University of uh, uh, Northern Vermont University, that was a two-year process because you have accreditation issues, Department of Education issues, et cetera. So if we're going to be making, and I, I don't know that we will be, but if we are, we're certainly going to talk about those things. If we're going to be making changes along those lines, there's a long lead time to do it. So we feel that we need to move forward expeditiously in, in getting to a point where we're ready to make those decisions by the end of this calendar year, because it won't happen immediately. I mean, if changes like that is coming, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to implement it. Um, so I think we're on a shorter timeline. I know you've got one report that's due um, in December about financial sustainability. Um, and obviously that's, that's one of the critical questions for us along with the other issues that you've identified. Peter Fagan. Thank you, Kate. Um, so regarding the UVM and the Vermont State Colleges, um, an equal number on this, rep an equal representation on this uh, committee, I think it's a good idea. Even if we add three, to UVM, and don't worry about you know who we're going to call out from the from the uh, from the study numbers. Um, I think it's important to to equally represent both sides, or else or else people aren't going to look at it um, uh, in, in a uh, in a realistic manner. Yeah, they may look at this as it was skewed from the start, so disregard it. We don't want that. We need good, solid recommendations that, that are actable upon when the legislature meets again. So, Bearing in mind that does, does have one campus. <laughs> Vermont State Colleges have, have four campuses four. and, yep. and uh, you know, uh, community college and towns around the state. So just I mean, I'm a double graduate of UVM. I appreciate UVM. I got both my bachelor's and my master's from UVM. I, I appreciate them and want them represented. Um, I am concerned about um, slowing the process down and, and, and loading it with educators. <laughs> uh, it was a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Not a, not a you know, Dylan. you will. Let's see, Dylan. Yeah, just, just one committee. piece. <laughs> Go ahead. Just this is no. This is a really good discussion. Um, one piece that I'm also weighing is just I have a real sensitivity uh, to a need to include faculty and students because the public signals around higher education are so deeply personal in a time of upheaval that um, that's where I, I I I'm very sensitive to the idea that they're very different institutions in terms of footprint and locations and so forth, but certainly the experience of a UVM student probably looks quite a bit different from some of the BSC students. And so I, I do think there could be a value in having them at the table. And then also the faculty, it's quite, they're quite distinct. Um, and so I, I share the sense of urgency and also appreciate some of the viewpoints we've had here because I just wanna make sure that voices are heard because in the world of big change right now, the greatest blowback I've seen, and it, this applies to my experience with the board recently, is people feeling as though they're not heard. And so I just go forward with that in mind, front and center with the education committee here, because it's going to be very important if changes come that voices are heard. We're back to our, we're back here again. <laughs> are we going against your desire to keep it at 20? Or are we going against your desire to have more people on it? They, they're mutually exclusive. So, <laughs> so who would like to increase the number on the work on the on the uh, steering committee, the select committee? I, if you could do blue hands, I would rather increase. The vote is I would rather increase um, the size of the select committee. So vote now. <laughs> and, and just to clarify, are we saying for UVM positions specifically for balance? I just want to no, make sure. No, I'm going to leave You're it. I'm saying 
because I'm hearing UVM and I'm hearing students. Okay. So, so we could say, yeah, to include UVM and students. So who would like to increase the number to increase more access for UVM and students? Vote now. Can I, can I just say something? Yes. For me, um, the numbers is one part of it, but the outcome of this task force is really important. And so I think for me, it's like whoever has the skills and knowledge where they can you know, come to a solution and work together with people, those are the, I'm looking at the skills and knowledge that people need to bring to make this happen as opposed to the numbers. So unfortunately, we're right now we're talking about the numbers. <laughs> I hear you on that. So the numbers we're at right now talking about, are we adding more voices from UVM and students? I see two, three, uh, no, I see three. Okay, who would rather keep the number Okay, I'm, I'm gonna still let it roll in here. So right now I have, I think I, there were three of you that wanted to um, increase the number. Okay, without I'll put hands down. <laughs> Who would like to keep the number of members lower without expanding? Okay, it looks like I've got four to three with me not voting that want to keep the numbers smaller. Make sure I'm not missing somebody here. Um, and the rest are not voting. Um, and that's four that would rather keep it smaller. Can we just look at the document again that talked about, um, uh, Kathleen, uh, just, but can we just get the, the play? There's a place in the document where you're, you're actually able to get get feedback from stakeholders, correct, Jim? Yeah. It's collaboration, it's I think uh, subsection F maybe. Um, let's see. Uh, collaboration, where they go? Uh, D, so it's on page three. Uh, subsection D right there. Okay. I'm gonna propose we add one more to UVM. <laughs> Would that help? That included a student. Comments? <laughs> um, I, I, see I, hands a raised, but I can't remember if there were votes or not. I can't tell if there are votes or not. So why doesn't everybody put your hands down <laughs> for a minute and we'll start again. <laughs> okay, so. Now, if you, if you have a comment you'd like to make. So Jay, who, who represents Castleton. Yes. Um, I mean, VTC. Uh, yeah. Vermont Tech, yeah. Um, you know, I, I get the, the desire to have everybody equally represented in terms of numbers, but uh, let's be honest, who, who is this about? This is about the state college's system, not UVM. I mean, UVM needs to be in the conversation, but I really don't think that it would be proportional to have an equal number of UVM, um, I don't wanna say advocates, but you know, people who are, who are more closely associated with the UVM perspective. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so is it necessary? It, given what we're talking about, is it necessary to have equal representation is what you're asking? Right, I, I think, yeah, go ahead. Kathleen? Um, yeah, just, I'll just say one last thing, <laughs> one last thing on this. It, it's about the entire post-secondary landscape, you know, in Vermont, one. Two, um, we did have some, I, two, I don't want the appropriation to get any higher. So, um, and three, we did build um, some flexibility into the list later on, I thought. So we have some sort of vaguely defined community members, um, which I, I think is great, um, but uh, there was some flexibility there. I thought we had some two at the discretion ofs. And so, you know, maybe if there's a way to keep the appropriation what it is, because I don't think we should spend any more money on this than we are, 
um, give UVM a slightly bigger voice um, so that, um, as Dylan said, all people are heard and build just enough flexibility into this so that we can stop, um, you know, micromanaging um, and, and let the list move forward in a way that allows enough flexibility and enough voices. And I don't know, I'm, I'm just remembering our past experiences with lists. And our oh desire my, to I'm adjourn and our desire to adjourn before the end of June. Right. So I'm I'm done I'm done commenting on the list. I've, I've it, said my it comments. Also, it goes to another body. Uh, it goes to another body. Let's also remember that. Um. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do about UVM. Um. I've asked them. They're actually in the Senate right now. So say they're down in the Senate right now, which. They're just in another little box somewhere. Um, we will get their feedback and they'll have opportunity to present feedback in, in, um, in the other body. I, I also just understand that this is going on the floor tomorrow. Correct, Peter? Thank you, Kate. I was just raising my hand. So <laughs> just, just how this is going to need to be connected with the, with the budget language, because the budget is already um, on the calendar for us to drop it in as just a, a part of, as if it came from us, we would have to pull the budget back into our committee. And that is not a good idea if we actually wanna be out of here uh, by the end of June. So my our recommendation, and I was on the phone with Kitty a little yeah. while ago, is for you to um, recommend an amendment. You can do it uh, prior to third reading. Um, that would give enough time to make sure that it's all it's all tidy and, and correct. Oh no, you're giving us more time. <laughs> <laughs> or you could do it tomorrow morning before right. we before we read it for the second time. Yeah, um, yeah. You know your your option. I will say this um, between Steve Klein and Kitty, uh, they also came up with the idea that that Kitty likes is that the cost of this study shall be from the appropriation that we set aside for bridge funding to the Vermont State Colleges. That way. Um, number one, we're not trying to identify a specific source of general fund money. Number two, we're not telling any bidders how much is that they've got to bid. You know, it's like the thing where you appropriate two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for some for a study. How much do they bid? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, gee, um, you know, you set yourself up for failure by doing it that way. Uh, this way, it would just it, it, we would state something to the effect that it would come out of the appropriation found in section whatever, um, yeah. and, and work it that way. I'm sure that's not good news to Sophie, but I, I think that actually makes well, it. There, there's there's going to be there, there's going to be a pretty significant amount of bridge funding uh, yeah. that will eventually end up in there. I haven't seen the treasurer's final report. I've I've heard mm -hmm. I've I've heard rumors, and and I and because it's just a an initial rumor, I am not going to share. Yeah, that sounds wise since we are public. <laughs> okay, um, Joyce, do you have anything to add? Sure, I'll just say a few words. Um, JFO did make small inquiries about the cost of, of such a study. Maybe six weeks ago, we were calling around to find out if there were firms out there that did this kind of work. And um, at the time, we were thinking of a much shorter time frame with a, with a final report due in December. And at that time, the, the uh, dollar figures range from about 100,000 to about a million, depending on what kind of firm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, uh, yeah, it, we're going to have to be really careful about how we write the RFP and, and how the selection is made of the consulting firm. So that's point number one. Point number two is that uh, JFO currently is listed as uh, providing technical and administrative assistance. It seems to us that this is a lot of work, a committee of, of 20 people, 22 people, plus the steering group meeting more often, plus the subcommittees. This is a lot of work, plus dealing with the, uh, with the consultant. So we are very grateful that Nebi is willing to help us, but we are still uncertain that we have the, the resources to do the job. So my office is, is trying to look around to see if there's another group out there that could take on more of the burden. 
So um, at the moment we are listed in, in the language, but uh, we're just warning you that, that uh, there are lots of other things on our plate. So we'll see what happens. And uh, this allows me to take a moment to just turn to Nebi to see if <laughs> you, can, you can be in conversation to see if there's more that you could do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the ready, just let us know how we can uh, support it. Okay. We, we so appreciate having you there. Um, I'm going to try to set up. So in terms of generally, in terms of, of the language, are folks then comfortable to be on this bill? Um, uh, other than just the, the last little bits about the, uh, you know, our, our foray into, into the, into the group, um, which I'll, I'll bring UVM in tomorrow. Um, if I can, are, are people comfortable with this? Would you, be, who would be in, uh, okay, Peter, did you have something else to say? Yes, yeah. just that uh, as far as the funding pieces under appropriations, we'll amend it uh, when, when it's presented in our committee. And so you don't need to worry about getting that, that correct. We, we okay. will take care of that, but it will be in accordance with what I just told you. It's okay. just, I just so don't know how the language is going to look. We'll leave that. We'll leave that language in the in the bill, and then you That's, can do yes. your appropriations yep. thing with it. Yep. Okay. Um, Sarita Austin. Um, I just. I guess I would just for. I, I kind of share Representative Dickinson's concerns about the redundancy, and I just would like to hear from um, Nebby about. If you've read the white paper, I feel like uh, Chancel Chancellor, uh, former Chancellor Spalding, um, came to a, had a rationale when he made the recommendation that he did. And my concern is we're going to spend a lot of money um, and a lot of people's time and come back to that similar conclusion. And I guess I would like some reassurance that by looking, I assume you've seen the white paper, maybe. Um, seen his recommendation that you can see because I, um, it's way too complex and a big issue for me that you can see that there are other solutions other than the one he recommended, um, considering all the issues that we brought into this. I guess I would just like some kind of assurance if we're going to spend this kind of money that we're not going to, two years down the road, come back to where we are and, and be in and be in much in a big, much bigger deficit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm happy to respond. Um, I think it's a really great point. You know, I think um, Interim Chancellor uh, Sophie Zadotny really, I think, spoke well to this. I don't know that it, there's, I could say anything more than she said. She hit it right on the on the nose. I do think uh, we're certainly familiar with the white paper. Nebby's been engaged with um, the former chancellor and others at various points over this important conversation. Um, you know, I think your point is one that we'll have to use as sort of a consistent beacon uh, to sort of navigate and triangulate. Uh, and it's exactly that. Let's not let's find a way to not be redundant here. I think a core theme that I've heard uh, from the beginning of the conversation around the select committee is uh, how this can be a platform to pull in the best work from the system and its various task forces uh, and to uh, push it even to a higher level, as Sophie said, to uh, be a conversation about the whole of post-secondary educations. Is it ought to be brought up regularly during this conversation and uh, to work Oops, just lost you for a minute there, Michael. I will just remind folks that there is um, a reference to looking at previous work in the bill that was following a conversation with you folks as well as with BSAC. So. I, I just think there's like $53 million of deferred maintenance on the facilities. Um, you know, that's just going to increase, you know, over two years. It's, I, you know, it's just concerning. And yeah. I, I just, I just want to uh, get out of this a really good solution that is sustainable and affordable and good for Vermont kids. Our efforts here are to make it something that it's not just a binder on a shelf. Yeah. 
Great points. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I uh, am going to, Avery, can you see if you can set something else up for us tomorrow morning and, and invite Wendy and Scott um, Giles in um, before floor? Yep, um, I can do that. And um, anything else? To Madam Chair, this is not a committee bill, is that correct? It will, it will be if you want to sign on to it. Okay. It's going to be an individual yeah. bill uh, with yeah. as, many, as many sponsors as you like. So put it this way, if anybody yeah. does not want to be a sponsor on this committee, let me know. Otherwise, I'll include the members. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. So your job is to let, let Jim know if you do not want to be on the bill. Um, Lynn, I don't know where you are. You can also speak to, to, to Jim if, you, if you'd like to. Um, it, it's, we've had basically a week to work on this and it's not been an easy task to do something this, that has this much weight to it and importance. And we've got to ship it off tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, 10 o'clock. It's on the floor. Uh, of course, we might have to do a little bit more with um, fishing licenses. So <laughs> on the floor tomorrow, it's, it's the second reading, correct? Not the third, or am I wrong? Um, that is, second reading is tomorrow. So it is possible, it is, you, you let me know. So Peter, what do you think? Should we just save it for Tuesday? You, were you trying to put this through all stages of passage or not? This bill will not be put through all stages of passage. It will okay. follow a normal track. So you could save it for Tuesday. I wouldn't count on, I know we're going to do floor Tuesday. So I, I yeah. think it's going to be finished Tuesday. So okay. you can come in, you know, Monday and present this. Okay. So we have a meeting uh, tomorrow afternoon at two. So maybe I'll just keep it at that point. Um, I think that might not be a bad idea because I've actually already got Wendy coming in. <laughs> um, I did notice that Caleb's not on I don't believe he's participating. So just maybe we could send him a copy or give him, a, let him know. Yeah. Well, it, it's 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 his responsibility to 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 know what we're doing. But I I will um I will let him know that he needs to do that. Thank you for that reminder. So <laughs> the only change I've got on this language is one to put into a different format. So amendment format and mm -hmm. a second to provide that members of the committee may, may serve in more than one role. Yes. Yep. That's the only thing I've, I've heard so far for changes. Yes, and then we're still debating on the UVM question now that we also know that it's being funding out of money that was supposed to go to the Vermont State College. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually gonna go there, Sophie, but that's what it looks like it was gonna be. Okay. Anything else then, committee? Any final words from Candace and, and Michael? No, just congratulations on uh, moving this forward. It's important work. If we can do anything else to help, please let us know. Definitely. Thank you. Um, so with that, I believe that we can go offline.